Hello and welcome to a very special How I Paint Things. Now today what I've got in front of me is one of the Rebels from the Chinese Boxes set from War Games Atlantic. They've sent along a box for me to have a look at and to review, so this one's going to be a little different to usual. We're going to start off with a quick review of the box itself and then get into the painting. Now I think you'll see here the aim is really something that's going to be quick and simple. Now the paints themselves that I'm going to use today aren't terribly important. You can mix and match this as much as you like because we aren't painting uniforms, which I'm going to say again later too. Nonetheless, all of the paints will be listed in the description below. So let's get into the review and then start painting. Now there are some much better images of the sprues available on the War Games Atlantic website, but let's have a quick look at them anyway. You get 30 men in a box of boxes. Uh, there are six sprues and they're all the same. Uh, there's five bodies on each sprue and they are a top and bottom combination. So unless you get the saw out, you're not going to twist the torsos around very much at all. But there's enough arms and a variety of weapons that you can give all of these guys melee weapons. There are even a couple of uh, fists which you can either use as clutching the, what do you call it, the shields. Or you could turn around and use them, you know, both unarmed hands on the same dude to have a boxer, Chinese boxing, as the foreigners at the time understood Kung Fu. So that's kind of cool. You have a regiment full of guys who are armed and then just one dude out the front who's throwing down. I, I like to look at that. I think it's really cool. Now something else which is interesting about the kit is that uh, while there are a couple of rifles, uh, they're lurking on here somewhere, but you've got two rifle options. One which is kind of firing and one being held out in front of the guy. So despite these being for the Box of Rebellion, uh, they are going to work much earlier in time if you want to do other peasant revolts or what have you. And they'll work as far forward as the Sino-Japanese War, uh, early World War II, and into the Chinese Civil War up until the end of 49. You know, your peasants, their look doesn't change very much. And since the bodies are blessedly the same width as all the other War Game Atlantic historical stuff, uh, arms from other kits will work perfectly well on there. It is going to require a little bit of jiggering to find out which ones really fit the best because baggier sleeves are going to work better with the look of the bodies. So real quick, here I've got a fella assembled with a rifle from the Italian infantry sprue and uh, it works pretty well. You know, I didn't have to fill any gaps with green stuff. The arms are decently spaced and he's holding the rifle naturally. Really easy to do that one. Uh, the one downside is going to be whether or not you're, you're willing to accept a little bit of fudging of what rifles are available. But the supply situation in China was chaos anyway. So no matter what period of time you're doing, uh, if you find something which is vaguely appropriate for the period and just apply it to the miniatures, it's going to work fine. And also, some arms from other manufacturers entirely are going to work. These are the Blitzkrieg German arms from Warlord Games. Uh, these did require a little bit of, like, probably squeezing into place. Super glue might have been easier to use here. But for the purposes of getting a peasant mob on the table armed with whatever rifles are available, again, really good kit, really interesting. Historically, it's neat. I don't know a huge amount about the period, so I've been reading up on the Box of Rebellion and, you know, finding it really fascinating. Uh, but for the versatility of the kit, I think it's a really interesting little box of miniatures. Okay, so we'll start by painting one of these fellas first of all with traditional acrylics. Now I've primed it with a spray of grey from Vallejo. Any light primer is going to do the job here. And I'm going to start by painting his skin. Here what I've got is Vallejo's beige red, and I'll give you a good reason for this. Uh, nobody's yellow. You know, there's a lot of column inches over the years spent on painting Chinese and Asian, you know, Indonesian skin tones and miniatures. Uh, but I think instead of painting yellow, which isn't really what anybody looks like, uh, most of the skin tones I've seen, you know, looking up reference images and what have you, Less red is really the answer rather than more yellow. So what I'm going to do is lay down more or less the same base color I would for any human skin, you know, pale complexion. When it comes to shading it, I'm not going to add more red, you know, a lot more warmth. And that's going to work for me just fine. 
Now next we're going to paint in the trim on his outfit. And this might seem like a bit of a leap because, you know, ordinarily you might think of this as being a final step. But because we're going to paint it so light, if we do it now, uh, we can tidy it up by painting over the darker color when it comes to the rest of his clothing. So don't worry too much if you do spill over a little. I'm using here Moon Dust from the Army Painter, which is a wonderful light yellow. It does cover very well for such a bright color. Now despite that, it won't cover perfectly in one coat, so that is two. And you'll see, especially across his chest, I haven't been terribly careful. What I've got here is some Brain Matter Beige, and I'm going to apply this to the sleeves uh, underneath the main jacket thingy that he's wearing. So I've got way too much water in there. Let's paint his other sleeve while, the, <laughs> while that first one dries. So a little bit of Brain Matter Beige, and likewise, this will cover very well, but you're still going to need two coats to get a nice solid base here. And don't forget at the same time, if your fella's got socks on with his shoes, paint those in as well. What I've got is grey blue. This is another Vallejo color here. But try not to get too hung up on exact colors. We are, after all, not painting uniforms here. But I like this because it's a nice, sort of faded blue. And uh, it will dry a little darker than it looks going on. So I'm going to apply this carefully, first of all, to tidy up the... Uh, the yellow stripe, and then I can start applying it over the rest of his clothing. Now with some Vallejo cork brown, I'm going to paint in both his bandana and also his little leg wraps down here. There's nothing saying that you couldn't paint these in two separate colors, but since they're going to be so far apart from one another, I figure just a generic linen wool sort of color will work perfectly well. Now for his trousers and his shoes, I'm going to use Vallejo's Black Grey here. Uh, anything like Corvus Black, Eschen Grey, German Grey, anything that's not a true black will work better here, I think, because actual real black in reality is quite uncommon and uh, looks a little unnatural on clothing. You'll see there's not really very much to painting them. I've got now some Mephiston red, and I'm going to paint in his belt. Although maybe a brighter red would look nicer here. We'll see what this looks like in a second. And then finally for his cleaver, I'm going to use Iron Hand Steel. But as always, something like plate mail metal or even oily steel will do the job just fine. Now we're going to get on to shading. Now I'm going to use the Army Painters washes here for a couple of reasons. First is I like the way that they cling and the way that they flow. And second is the sucker here, Soft Tone. Now Soft Tone and Citadel Seraphim Sepia used to be quite similar to one another. Uh, now Seraphim Sepia has been updated and it is basically yellow and I do not like how strong that yellow is. We're going to stick with Soft Tone. But we're also going to mix in some strong tone. So first of all, uh, just so that I've got enough for my miniature, I'm going to one, two, three, let's say four drops of soft tone. And the same again of strong tone. One, two, three, four. And now I've got here the quick shade mixing medium. Now folks always ask, do you mean the, the paint medium, the wall paints medium, or the quick shade medium? Quick shade using quick shades. And we'll go here. One, two, three, four. Same as the others. So equal mix of strong tone, soft tone, and mixing medium. Then I'm going to get a slightly damp brush and just mix that all together. If it still seems a little gloopy to your eyes, what you can do is dab your paintbrush into the water again. Now you're not looking to add huge dollops of water. Just while it's still got that shade on it, uh, it will pick up enough that you can start thinning it out very gradually until it flows the way that you want it to. And then once you're satisfied with that, you can start applying it over the entire miniature. Now make sure that you are working it up under his arms, into any recesses, and pay attention, once you've applied it, it will start sliding around and settling. And uh, if you get any big dollops, you can move those around while they are still wet. 
And once this has been completely coated, we'll leave it somewhere to dry for about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, depending on what the weather is like where you are. Now, once it starts to settle, you can get a damp brush and shift it around, pull it out of any recesses where it's pulled too heavily, or straighten up any creases where you want a slightly more defined edge. Now, once that dries, you're going to have something that looks like this, and it's a little grimy in some places. You could dry brush it back up very easily, but what I'm going to do, you might have seen me sneakily testing already, this is amber flesh or amber skin from, yeah, amber skin from the Army Painter. This is from their skin tone range, and I'm looking forward to them releasing these individually because the box itself is super useful, but if you do only want one or two colors, then that would be nice. But you'll see as I put this on, it's not so much that it's yellow, but it isn't very red. So what we get is a nice highlight color here, which works really well over the skin tone we've already done without looking like a big gross cartoon. Then sticking with the Army Painter, I'm going to add a few lines of fog gray just at the edges of folds of his cloak. What would this be called? You know, I actually don't know what this uh, particular style of jacket and what have you is called, but oop, there's way too much. Something that I really like about the Army Painter acrylics is the fact once you've put one line on, it will dry and you get a little bit of translucency, which lets the color underneath show through. Give it a couple of seconds to dry and then you can dab on another touch of it at uh, higher points or what have you. And you almost get a two-stage highlighting effect as it solidifies that color without having to do two or three different colors. You don't have to mix anything. So with Army Painter, try your highlight colors a little bit lighter than you might think. And to that end, I have here Arid Earth. And I'm going to do just a little bit of this, tiny wee little bit of it really, on the corners of the yellow. So we'll use some Banshee Brown here to highlight the uh, bandana. Uh, but very specifically, I'm not going to do anything to his leg wraps because eh, they're fine the way they are. And if you are knocking out large amounts of infantry, concentrate on the parts that people are going to see. Basically, waist up. This way you want to concentrate your efforts. So the last actual highlight we're going to apply is some Mars Red, which is really a nice sharp orange color. Same principle applies, just a few little lines here or there. If you want to sharpen it up a bit more, wait for it to dry and uh, add a little bit more paint in a second pass. Now, the last thing that I'm going to do is to try something new. So, uh, fingers crossed. Ordinarily, if you want to get away with not painting eyes, you can jam a little bit of Agrax Earthshade or something similar into the sockets. Adding a little bit of purple also helps. But what I've got here, this is a new shade. This is Targor Rage Shade, which is a very faint purple. What I'm going to do is just dot this into the eyes as carefully as I can. Goodness me. Now that looks super subtle once it's dried. It looked a lot, a lot stronger when I was applying it. So that's something to have a bit of a play around with. What I'm going to do now is take this fella outside, hit him with a matte varnish, and I'm going to go ahead and apply a base to him. Let's get a look at what these fellas look like when he's all finished. And there at last, our Chinese Rebel is complete. And I thought this was really interesting because, like I said, it's a period of history I don't know a huge amount about. So as well as the miniatures themselves being pretty cool, uh, like with a lot of historical stuff, it encourages me, I'm now going to cruise onto Wikipedia, get some sources, and do a bit of reading. This is really fascinating. I like how this dude's turned out. Uh, I think you could probably cut a couple of corners if you wanted to finish a large number of them much more quickly, but I'm happy with the result there for the amount of time put in. So thank you again to Wargames Atlantic for sending me along the kit to have a play with, as well as Exit 23 Games for the light and sound equipment, and all of my wonderful patrons who are keeping me ticking in paints and glue, including my producers Alan Nuttall, Kyra Crawford, Andrew, Rod, and Jimmy. Your support means the world, folks. Any questions or anything, feel free to drop them in the old comment box below. My Twitter and Instagram are both linked there too. So thank you very much for your time, one and all, and you all enjoy the rest of your day.